Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Father Helmut Schuler, leader of the Austrian Priest Initiative. Father Schuler has earned a bit of a reputation as a rebel within the Austrian Catholic Church. But when you look at his life work, which I will briefly overview, you see a passionate man who has dedicated his life to his faith regardless of whether you concur with his positions. He was ordained in 1977, having been called to the priesthood during a Second Vatican Council era that many hoped would lead to major reform in the church. On the subject of Vatican II reform, author John Allen Jr. in his 2000 biography of Joseph Ratzinger, who on April 19, 2005 became known as Pope Benedict XVI, noted Ratzinger's critical role in the council. Ellen writes that, quote, Ratzinger today has clearly lost the ardor he once felt for Vatican II, close quote, and then cites the following quote from the future pope. Not all valid councils have proven, when tested by the facts of history, to have been useful, end quote. Now, Father Schuler has not responded enthusiastically to the concept of a third Vatican council to further reform, stating, according to a recent Huffington Post story, that, quote, church leaders, when they're not accountable to the people of God, can do with the results of a council whatever they want, end quote. Exactly. Continuing our speaker's life journey, in 1991, Pope John Paul II bestowed the honorary title of Monsignor Chaplain of His Holiness on Father Schuler, a designation that was stripped last year. In 2006, Father Schuler organized the aforementioned Austrian Priest Initiative in response to the shortage of priests which had resulted in the closing of Austrian parishes. Now, that shortage is, of course, a significant issue in the U.S., where according to the Center for Applied Research and the Apostolate, the total number of priests in the U.S. has decreased from about 58.6,000 in 1965 to about 39,000 in 2012. And during that same time, the number of self-identified U.S. Catholics has increased from about 48 and a half million to 78, just over 78 million. In 2011, Father Schuler issued a global call to disobedience, advocating, among other things, for the admission of women and married people to the priesthood and enhanced lay leadership and transparency in church governance. His positions are at odds with official church policy, but touch on issues that provoke significant discussion in local parishes in the United States and beyond. That reality is evidenced by the fact that the call to disobedience has spawned similar reform movements across the world. Now, some have suggested that with his general disposition and quoting a recent New York Times article, quote, deep blue eyes, close quote, <laughs> Father Schuler's appearance and demeanor belie any suggestion of disobedience. Our local and broadcast audiences will now have an opportunity to reach your own judgments. I present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Father Helmut Schuler. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you about the Priest Initiative in Austria and our international networking with our, with our colleagues and with the church reform movements, also now in the moment in the United States, but all over the world and also in Europe especially. As Mr. President told you, we started our initiative uh, with, out of the deep sorrow for the future of the parish communities at the, at the base of the church and of society. This level is the one where the, the church is concretely reaching out for the people in their daily life. Ha, uh, where the church is, is able to contact them to develop companionship for them, and to be companions for the people uh, in their sometimes really difficult situations of life. To reach out for those who are, in, at the are living at the margin of our societies and practicing solidarity in a community which was rediscovered by the Second Vatican Council. Second Vatican Council rediscovered the people of God, the people of church, put it in the center of its thinking about itself, and the chapter in, in, in the most, uh, most uh, important document uh, speaking the church for, about itself, Lumen Gentium, the ministry for this church, 
uh, is handled and described in the chapter after the chapter about people of God. It means it's clear that hierarchy and <coughs> ministry as priests is related to these people of God as ministries. Therefore, we are in deep sorrow about the future of our church at the base of society also. Because sometimes when I'm discussing with bishops our sorrow, I have the, I, I have the impression of an, of an interplanetarian uh, dialogue. <laughs> and sometimes we find much more resonance at, let me say, mayors or local political leaders, uh, m much more resonance for this question because they feel the relevance and the importance of a vivid, of a vibrant uh, community at the base of society. And they, they appreciate the services which are done by these communities to society in, in different issues from the integration of immigrants, from the taking care for the, for the old people. Also the, the dialogue with other, with other religions, so very often uh, parishes are offering platforms for, this, for these dialogues in Europe, I think also in the United States. So, out of this sorrow, we, uh, we asked our bishops to, to, to start a new dialogue in our church. Because when it's, when, it's, when, when it's clear that we have a shortage of priests in the now church, church order, then we should open this priesthood uh, because these communities need leaders. And therefore, we, we, asked for, we are asking for an opening of the, of the ministry of the priesthood for married men also and for women. Uh, the opening for the women is not only um, a question of shortage of, of male priests, but it is a principal question. A church, a, a religion which is messaging that woman, men and women are together image of God in this world, must represent this message also in, this, in its ministerial structures, as we think. So therefore, opening to, to the, of the priesthood for the, uh, for the women is not only a response to the, to the secular uh, woman of, uh, the secular movement of, 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 of women and of having the equal rights, but we are also asking for more participation of lay people in the decision-making of the church. Because we think that the, the baptized, the lake people, we sometimes are also speaking about the church citizens. They are gifted for bringing into the church their experiences with, with life, their experiences in faith, their experiences with bringing up, uh, with developing their faith in, in our time. So it would, it, it, it would be very necessary to bring in all those gifts in the decision-making of our church. Sometimes uh, the Catholics are very well-educated, I, I think, also in this country, so they are very afraid to ask for participation. But they are very often told they have responsibility for the church, but to have responsibility without participation in the decision-making is a very dangerous thing. <laughs> Therefore, we are... Uh, asking more fundamentally uh, in, at the end of the day for a kind of constitution for this church. It might be, inter it might be interesting for you that Pope Paul VI started in the early 60s, in the, in the, in the late 60s, uh, a project named Lex Ecclesiae Fundamentalis. In Latin that means in English a kind of ground law, a kind of fundamental law for the church with the target to get fundamental rights for the citizens of the church, for the baptized, into the system. It is astonishing maybe for you that a, a pope had started such a project. Uh, but he did out of the consequences of the Second Vatican Council, because this rediscovery of the people of the church meant, uh, provoked the question after the rights of these people. And therefore, I think it would be a very, it, it, it is a very important, uh, very important project to continue this project which was for itself buried first class in the early 80s under John Paul II. 
I think after the Vatican system had realized that uh, such a constitution would, would really rock the boat. <laughs> yes, that is a very, uh, for us, a, a very fundamental uh, vision to have a church in which the fundamental rights of self-understanding part of, of its structures. And if we would have, if, if we would had have such a structure in our church, in all this issue, uh, sexual child abuse, and so on and so on, I think the things would, would have been handled in quite another way. But also these questions uh, are related to it, of uh, the election of bishops, the nomination of bishops, which have, which have the support of the people at the ground level of the, of the church. We are also moved by the, by the vision uh, that is expressed in the, in, in the other document of the Second Vatican Council, the uh, Gaudium et Spes. In Gaudium et Spes, where the Second Vatican Council is speaking about its pastoral in our society, in our time, is announcing that the, that the church will start its, its march into this society to become companion of the society of our time. And, to, and want, uh, that the church wants to be confronted with the, with the important questions of this time. And, John, and Pope John XXIII said very often that he thinks uh, that not only the society and world uh, have to learn from church, but also the church from society and time. So it was a very interesting awakening at the Second Vatican Council, and we as parish priests, as pastors in our parishes, are deeply moved by this perspective, because we are already accompanying the people of our time. We, are, we, we, we can see the situation of their life, we can see the questions which are arising from different situations. And therefore, we are also asking for a renewal of our moral teaching, because to look at what is happening in the lives of the, of the people, what is happening, especially for one example, in the development of human relationships, of human partnerships, must be important for us. We, are, we, we have a, 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 an urgent need uh, for a new looking at these issues, especially when you think all these discussions about, about uh, the divorced, remarried people, and also about uh, the people with homosexual orientation. To, to include them, to accept them in their, in their orientation, to have them with us, and to respect also their trying to build up relationships which are founded on trust, on confidence, on taking care for one another. And therefore, I should, I should think we should shift our concentration from the external form of partnerships and relation to their, to their quality. And that would be the ground for a new discussion of all these, these issues, I think. We have also a very urgent need for a, a, a renewed language for our faith and our praying. As I've learned in the United States, there is going on a very vivid uh, discussion about the new, the new Roman Missal uh, for the Eucharist, for saying the Eucharist. And I think th uh, that issue is touching a very a more principal question. How can we find a new language for what we want to say in the name of Christ? How can we find a new language for delivering the gospel to to, to human beings today. That we will be very risky, and it will, be, uh, it will cost a lot of, of, of it, it will cause a lot of problems, because to, to, to look for a new, a new language means there is a lot of, there's a, a large space for misunderstandings and for discussions and so on. But with, uh, we think it's the wrong direction backwards <laughs> to have a missile, which language which, uh, in which the language has to be as narrow as possible to the Latin original text. Cannot be the language 
we are understood in by the people of our time. But it's not the missile, it's, it's, it's our language, our teaching, our presenting the faith of, of, of God, and the faith in, in, into God, and into Jesus Christ, and the delivering of his gospel to our time. So we, we started this, peri this priest initiatives movement with all these issues and some others also. I, want, I do not want to, to overload you with, uh, with ideas and visions now. Maybe in the discussion that we could clarify something or add something, comments. We started this priest initiative movement uh, out of this deep sorrow 2006. And then we visited our bishops. That was the first thing we did politely, polite as we are, well-educated as we are, the first who sh whom we should address are the bishops of, in Austria. We have nine diocesan bishops, six of them were ready to, to uh, speak with us, but the result was very poor. The disputes, there were not any disputes, uh, le let me say the, the dialogues, so-called dialogues, were very polite and very cultivated. Uh, and bishops sometimes are doing some tea in your cup and all these all these things. So there is there is no lack of of being polite to us. But, and they wrote down a, a, a lot of things on their on their papers at, ahead of them. But what what happened with these papers? We don't know up to now. And very often we get we, we get the information that these things cannot be discussed at the diocesan level. Rome is deciding what's happening, which music should be played. <laughs> and so we, we tried to meet Pope Benedict XVI, 2007, when he visited Austria. We asked to have the occasion of a maybe short m meeting, but to present directly to him, as we are told that, uh, that Rome is deciding the things. <laughs> and then we were told, no, it's not possible because the Pope is coming as a pilgrim. And the pilgrim, a pilgrim doesn't discuss. <laughs> so we had to write a letter. We did. It's extremely difficult for priests to be short, yes? <laughs> so <laughs> so we, 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 we wrote a short letter, a very short letter, one page only, because we have learned that CEOs and, and all that uh, persons are, are, are very comfortable with having only one paper before them. One, one, one sheet. And so we wrote, him our, wrote to him our desires, our sorrows, and after seven months, I think, uh, Archbishop Schönborn received an answer because we were not to address for an answer because we, we don't exist officially. <laughs> so he was asked uh, to tell us that there is no need for questions and, not on, on, and the answers are clear. So we were one step forward or backward or somewhere. And then I was invited by the uh, papal nuncio uh, to lunch in Vienna, a very fine Italian lunch. <laughs> and we had um, a lot of, of conversation and discussion. He was a very interesting man. He, is, he's, he was born in Lebanon. He's, uh, he's member, of the me member and priest of the Maronite Church, which will be important in some seconds. And he, yes, he wanted, he wanted to know uh, more about this priest initiative. And at the end of this lunch, he asked me two questions. The first was a very astonishing uh, question. What do you think, Father Schiller, are the problems of the Romans with optional celibacy? I was very astonished about this question of a nuncio to me. <laughs> and, as he's, and as he realized my astonishment, he, he, he he's told me, because I am priest of the Maronite Church, which is part of our church, like the Greek Catholic one. And we have married priests and unmarried, and there are no problems. So I told him, please, Excellenz, Excellency, tell this not us, but at the top of our church. I said, yeah, yes, I try to do it. And then the second question was, why, do you, why don't you go to Rome and to confront them with your with your ideas. And we went to Rome. <laughs> and we wanted to leave, to meet uh, some responsible persons. It was not very easy, because when we 
It took the Anuario Pontificio, which is the register of all these persons and names and email numbers and so on and so on. And I, we asked for dates and for meetings. And only the CDF answered, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Yes, we could have an, a discussion. We should come there and there, then and then. And then when we, when, when we, arrived, when we had arrived in Rome, I had a phone call at my cell phone. Here's the CDF. It's not possible to have a discussion because there are, there are problems of time. Then I phoned Cardinal Schönborn in Vienna. Uh, is it possible that we cannot have a meeting? And then he cleared it for us. And so we, and uh, the thing was brought before the Pope and he decided we should, one should speak with us, one office. It should be the CDF. So we were back at field one uh, of this. And so, and so we were there and we presented our thinking and our ideas to Erzbischof Luis Ladaria, who is the Soto Secretario, uh, the, man, the man who is running the congregation, really, uh, and a Spanish Jesuit, a bishop. And he listened to us also very politely, very cultivated, very open-minded. And the, at the end of this discussion, uh, I asked him if there is something we have presented now that would be uh, against our faith, against the substance of our faith? And he, his answer was, no, that are very important questions, but you should discuss them with your bishops in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of this, of this meeting, there was a young, a young priest in the room, and he commented then after his chief in an, quite another way, all these things are not uh, are not uh, compatible with our faith, with our with the church teaching, and we should we should it would be better we should finish it. So, the the assistant was overruling the chief in the same room. A very interesting, very interest, interesting impression and experience, thinking of how the whole structure is really uh, be so is, is 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 really functioning. Yes, and then in 2011, we did, we did this uh, call for disobedience, this very provocative, shocking, terrifying word, <laughs> disobedience. Very shocking in the church, because it was never heard before by, by priests. But we had two very, very, um, to be honest, two very, two very uh, serious reasons for it. The first one is, we are realizing that we are doing our obedience in a system in which those who are asking for obedience are not controlled for anyone, uh, by anyone. Those who are in power are not controlled. And I think obedience must be embedded in a system where those who are in power are controlled, as it is in all our society systems in a democratic system. That means that is the first and very principal reason. We want to address this system, which is asking for obedience without controlling those who are asking for it. Look at the monasteries of the Benedictines. There you have this system. The abbot is elected. He's accountable to his monks. And if the things are going wrong, uh, they has elected a new abbot. And, then, and the abbot gets, gets his goodbye. Uh, so it cannot be incompatible with our system to ask for accountability, to ask for control of power. The second reason was for our disobedience that we are realizing more and more that our obedience is going to be abused for keeping down the legitimate desires and expectations of church reform at the peoples, uh, from the people of God the people of church. That means we, we as priests should keep down all that and we should deliver to the people the message from the top. There is no need for any change. And to be obedient in such a system sounds to me almost dangerous. If you know what I mean, we as, we as Austrians and Germans, we, we know exactly what we are speaking about, uh, only functioning obedience from the top to the bottom, 
has caused a lot of victims. And I think I, have, I did no, no, no scientific research, but I think there are more, much more victims of obedience than of disobedience in the history of mankind. And the third reason was to come to, come to an end of my presentation. The third reason was for it that we are realizing that we are practicing as priests in the pastoral daily, but also silently, disobedience. And the bishops know very well when we are breaking the church orders and the church laws by inviting divorced and remarried uh, to the communion, when we are breaking the church, the church order in letting, uh, letting uh, be part of decision-making, that the lay people be part of the, the decision-making, in reaching out for the communities of the other Christian churches for having the common holy meal and so on and so on. So we think it's not healthy for a system and for a church to have a double level life. On the, on the, on the ground level, we are practicing disobedience silently and on the top level, we, 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 we do so, we, uh, we behave as there would be no change. So, that were some reasons uh, for using this terrifying, shocking, uh, really terrible word. Uh, but we, we have also realized that we must have touched a very uh, important point in the system with it. Therefore, the nervousness is, is growing about our, our decision. But, and that's the end of my presentation. We are, in our, in our, in our movement, we are gathering those priests who have decided for advocacy for the people of the church in very, dif in very difficult times where the governors of this church, the governance of the church seems not to be aware about the need for, for change. And we want to support the lake movements because we know very well that they have, they have tried their best up to now since decades and they were sidelined. They were not respected and they were sidelined and now we want to give them support from our side and to struggle with them all this difficult way along to come to, to some changes in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, uh, which is inspiring us and not only us, but the vast majority of the Catholics, I think, all over the world. So thank you very much for your paying attention to me and I am ready then afterwards to to do some conversation in question and answers, but up to now it should be enough. <laughs>
Carrie Miller, and Development Associate Michael Cromaldi. First question, please. Father, uh, before I ask this question, Hello. <laughs> uh, I, it's only fair to let you know that there are three members of Roman Catholic women priests here today. Uh, an active priest, <laughs> a candidate, that's me, and our bishop is here from Pittsburgh with us today. <laughs> so, now that you know that we're here, <laughs> what do you think? Yes, we are. Our point of view is that uh, these women who who asked to be ordained are very prophetic women in our women in our church. It will be at the end of the day. It it will be a very important contribution to the development in this direction. Also, we have some discussion about how come to the to an official opening of. Of, the, of our church for priesthood for the women. Not only as you were urged to come in from the, by the back door, but all to come in at the, at the front door. And therefore we, we must continue, I think, uh, we, we must continue for this official opening of the church as a whole for this, uh, for this development. And therefore we are appreciating uh, and we are respecting this decisions which brought you in a very difficult situation as you feel it difficult I don't know exactly because it's the one the one uh, the one thing is to become excommunicated but the other thing is to feel excommunicated exactly. and I think with this difference exactly with this difference I think you should you you are living now and uh, we will we will have I think a very deeply uh, very deep respect for for you and we are, we, are, we are very often asked, also by our friends, abolish this, uh, this issue from your program because it would be easier uh, for you to be spoken with also, uh, to come in dialogue with the bishops. Also priests are very afraid that we could uh, rock the boat of, of dialogues with this issue and we say no, we, are, we want to be honest, we want to be clear, we, we, we should say what we are really wanting, what we are really wishing and not to be too diplomatic in that, in that way. <laughs> That's also my, my point of view to the, to, uh, to the question should, should as, a, as a next step, step should women become uh, deacons? Uh, we in the Paris Priest Initiative have a very, uh, have a special point of view to it because we think you have to, to keep in mind that in the moment there are things going on to downgrade the office of, of the, the ministry of the deacons so that it should be in, in future not anymore a part of the hierarchy. The second is it could, it could be that uh, to get this consecration or to or ordination of women for, for deaconry could be also a trap that in the sense that's it. Uh, and therefore, I think it's a, also a question of strategy to stay on with this clear opening of the ministry of bishophood, priesthood, deaconry for women, officially and at the front door. That's our, shortly, shortly told to you, uh, that's our opinion. Um, Father, there are already a number of Christian groups that have followed your lead. They have women clergy, they approve of divorce, they approve of homosexual acts. Liberal Protestantism has gone down that road. We know what happens. The Episcopal Church in this country has lost a quarter of its members in the past decade. The United Church of Christ, based here in Cleveland, has lost half of its members during a period of time when the U.S. population has doubled. Why wouldn't adoption of your ideas lead the Catholic Church to experience the same dramatic decline in members that liberal Protestantism has experienced all around the world? We have to stand up for these issues out of principle, faith. To be afraid to be not successful with it is a capitalistic but not a Catholic argumentation. <laughs> Uh, 
if we would get more troubles than we have, we have to do it because it's our opinion, it's our conviction out of the principles of our faith. And as I am informed, it was also not the point of view of Jesus to look how many people will follow him when he, him saying when what. So, beg your pardon. That's it. Uh, Father Schiller, uh, uh, taking a term, a term from several hundred years back crusade, uh, you have really led a, a, a contemporary crusade to reform the Catholic Church. And the uh, Pope uh, certainly has not been cooperative, put it mildly. But now there's a new Pope, Pope Francis, with some new ideas. Uh, what hopes do you have that uh, the new Pope will be more receptive to some of the reforms that you have advocated? Yes, there's a lot of hope in the air in the moment, because the signals uh, and the gestures of this, of this Pope are very interesting uh, concerning all these issues we have uh, to, come, to come along as, as one uh, who, is, uh, who tries to speak very on the same level to the people, who, t who, in, who is announcing that he will be interested in a collegial uh, governance of the church, as he has told us sometimes, uh, to, to announce a, 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 a concrete option of this church for the poor, to being with the poor, and to take the name Francis yeah. of Assisi, which is not only interesting because of being with the poor, but Francis was a laic man, don't, don't forget it. That means it could be also a, a, an expression of his reference and of his respect for the gifts of the lake people in this church. Franz von Assisi was really urged at the end of his, of, of his life to, to become deacon, so that the church had, had him in the hierarchy a little bit. <laughs> but that was not really successful because his charisma was that of, of, a, of a lake man who was baptized and gave to this church a lot a lot of gifts. So let's see what will happen. Uh, our desire is that this slowly, and we have respect for the need of time and all, the, all that, but that slowly all these symbols and signals and gestures uh, be are, uh, should become systemic changes in our church. That means that, the, that at the end we, 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 we do not have the old system with a new face on the top but that we have uh, a church designed by the spirit of Francis from Assisi and uh, inspired by those signals uh, Pope Francis is, is delivering to us. So that's my opinion to it. Father, you mentioned your sorrow over the priest shortage. Uh, you also mentioned Pope Paul VI and his uh, Lex Ecclesia Fundamentalis. At about the, about the time he wrote that, uh, 45 years ago yesterday, actually, he also issued his encyclical letter, Humanae Vitae, of human life, in which he uh, restated the church's teaching uh, against artificial contraception and predicted many of the evils that would flow from it. Uh, that teaching, as you know, has been widely disregarded by Catholics now for 45 years and by many of their pastors. And uh, the birth rate in Austria has been declining ever since. So my question is, uh, what connection do you see between that uh, rejection of Humanae Vitae and the Pope's teaching and the priest, the so-called priest shortage? Thank you. For me, it's interesting that the birth rate is growing in countries which are not really Catholic in Europe. France, Sweden. And why is it not growing in typical Catholic countries? I think that does not depend on what the priests are thinking about Kumane Vitae. There I have the point of view which, was, which is the point of view of, of the Austrian Bishops' Conference from 1968. They, they commented on it that they stay on with, with their point of view that this is a decision we have to respect done by the women and the parents. 
Uh, that was, there, were, w w there was a lot of conflict in the air between the Vatican and, and the German and the Austrian bishops' conference, I think also the American one, I don't, I, I'm not informed qu quite well. But I think that is, I think, out of the vision of the Second Vatican Council, also our position to be, to have, uh, to practice companionship to the people in their decision making in the, in the, in, in the questions they have to, to answer. We, are, we have confidence that the Catholics, the women and men, have faith and gifts by the faith and experience of life for this decision. And yes, that is our opinion to this uh, Humane Vitae. Uh, that, that, that shows us that we have a very differentiated, a very di well differentiated uh, impression by the different popes. Uh, that means the appreciation for the constitution idea is the one thing, and the dissatisfaction with Humane Vitae is the other thing. But that should be part of our, of, of our church, to come to an open uh, discussion, to an open dialogue about all these issues. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to move on in this pastoral and deeply confidential way of, of, of accompanying the people of our time in their decisions and the decisions which are, which are concerning their personal life and, and their family. Thank you, Father, for coming to Cleveland and giving us your viewpoints. I um, enjoyed your speech today. I would like to ask you a question about uh, don't you believe, or would you believe that there's a strong tradition of women in the church up until about the year 312 at the Nicene Council? Women are allowed to be priests in the church. They were allowed to be bishops. Um, would you agree that it was a tradition up until a point? We know more and more about uh, the, the so-called uh, circumstances and structures and growing structures uh, of, of our church and of the Christian church. At the, at quite, quite at the beginning. And we are discovering a lot of things, also that the structures, also the structures of, of the ministry developed very slowly and very differently on different places in different ways. As we know today, the, the communi communities of St. Paul developed quite in another, in another way than those of the, other, of, 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 of the other founders of communities. And we have a lot of hints that women played a central role in this, also in the leading of the communities. Uh, for me, it's uh, for me, it's St. Mary Magda of Magdala, a very interesting experiment, also because for some moments in the history of this church, the fate of this church was exclusively in the hands of this woman. It was a moment between the visit of the tomb of Jesus and the meeting with the apostles. And therefore, I think uh, we, can, we can see that uh, we have to, to look very intensively and also very carefully to these to this origins of our church. And it could be also an opener for a new dialogue about ministry, the opening of the priesthood and of the leading of our communities for women. Thank you, Father, for being here. Um, first of all, I would just like to say on behalf of uh, all my gay and lesbian and transgendered friends that if, I hope they had a chance to hear you because you give them hope. I know that so many of my friends want to be at the table, and I'm hoping they had a chance to hear you. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, the other thing, I, I know it's probably embedded in your talk, but could you talk a little bit about the concept of the tipping point, which is part of your literature? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, it's an interesting question because uh, the creation of this title, uh, I was involved, but I, 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 I created it by myself. We are moving, I think, to this tipping point. We are not there already but we can feel it. Because more and more uh, Catholics dare to speak out clearly of all generations and uh, of more and more regions. They became 
they become conscious that they, they, they have, they should have fundamental rights in this church. They become conscious that they are gifted for, uh, for, being, uh, for being a member of this church in that sense that they are also allowed to participate in the decisions of this church. And therefore, I think we are moving to that, to that point, and I hope that we will reach it. But it's not in our hand. <laughs> the, what, there is one, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is directing the movement. And we will see which of all these contributions to the future of the church will be in his or her mind. <laughs> and therefore, I think uh, it's not only, it's, it's not our, our strategy. It's a, our strategy, our thinking to come forward is a contribution to it. What will be at the end of the day, we will see and we will be happy if there some something of what we have done and we have tried contributed to the, to the change. But I want you to, to remember the year 1989. It is for us in Europe a very decisional uh, year. It was the year of the tipping point in Eastern Europe. At the beginning of 1989, nobody would have thought that at the end of 1989, Europe will be there in quite a, to a totally another shape. And things we have dreamed of for decades, but not really believed that will happen, happened. Very suddenly, very surprisingly. And when, we are, when, you, when you look back, you can see changes are always results of different uh, things that are happening. There is the, the, the movement of those who are struggling for faith. But there are also uh, circumstances who at a special moment are supporting this struggle, as it has happened in Europe. I was deeply matched by this, by this, uh, by this year, 1989, because I, for myself, uh, have grown up at very near to the, to the Iron Curtain in the east of Austria. And we grew up with the impression, yes, there should be a move, there should be a change, there should be new freedom for the people behind this Iron Curtain, our co-Europeans. But we really thought it, would, it, it will happen. And then when we, when we saw the Berlin Wall fall down, it was deeply, deeply touching. And I think that's a good example for the possibility of sudden changes that are not awaited. And so let's hope that something will happen, but it's my principal thinking, not for the, for the victory of someone's ideas, but as something that is brought by the Spirit to our Church, Spirit of God. And we have now responsible to think what could be our contribution. We have to reflect, we have to pray over it, we have to pray together. We have to discuss all the things with one another, uh, but then we have to, to act and we have to take steps as we think we should. We hope, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that it's uh, that these steps are also contributions to this possible change. Father, on behalf of my husband and my daughter and my other two daughters, I thank you with all my heart for not excluding the question of women priests from the discussion because of the justice issue and because we've raised them to be strong, active Catholics and we want them to be in a church in which they can be full members. I want to ask your advice to lay and priest association organizations that are trying to do work similar to the work your association is doing. How do the organizations not become entrenched and hierarchical and exclusive and how do they work communally, work together and work with the members and reach out to the rest of the church so we don't become what we're trying to change? Well, I think uh, that's one of the things I try to do here, 
to encourage my colleagues in the priesthood, in the ministry of the priests, to, to make this decision to support the movements for change in this church. It's, the decision is a little bit difficult, and then as, as I have learned, for example, in many dioceses of this country, uh, priests are totally dependent on their bishops, also concerning their livelihood. That means open speaking is not so, is not so easy. There could be sanctions, there could be consequences we don't think in the moment, or have in mind it at the moment. So it needs also a strong support from the side of the sisters and brothers in the faith to give this to the priest and to give them the feeling that they, if they would make the decision to take side at the people of God and to become advocates for their desires and their expectations, they would be supported strongly. Uh, and also, I think it would be very, very important for us, especially for us priests, to have a clear underst understanding in what is a dialogue and what not. I think to, invi to be invited in f for a dialogue or to start a dialogue means always to clear the framework of this dialogue, to free the rights of the participants, to have a decision about the implementation of the results, to have a decision about who is presenting these dialogues to, uh, to, the, to the public, and also the question of the monitoring of the implementation, and the question of the, of, of the protection in this dialogue of those people who are dependent because they are employed by the church. Uh, therefore, I th that is a very, a very sensitive issue, but we strongly uh, try to to, to make courage, to, to bring courage and to say you will not be alone if you, the priests, are standing together, if you are standing up each uh, for, for one, one for another, and if you give uh, support to, uh, uh, to one another and to stand up and speak clearly if some, some of you is sanctioned. And I think that would be very important. And the other thing is to, uh, to bring together uh, in this international networking that we should bring together all, the, all, all these movements on an international level also. Because I think this international level is important for bringing forward all these, all these issues and all these questions and desires on the worldwide church level. Uh, thank you, Father, for everything you've been saying and the hope that you bring to us. But I'd just like to refer back to one of the things that you mentioned in your talk, and that was your experience in the meeting with the older priest who was giving you hope versus the younger priest who was there, who was trying to be more official and hierarchical and uh, in his comments to you. Right now, as it stands, the future of our church, right now, is the younger priests. How do we reach them? Um, I've heard so many people who have experienced younger priests in their parish and will say their sermons were, were so uninspiring. They were so the letter of the law. They were so anti-lay participation, anti-women. How can we reach them and begin to make a difference? I would disagree with you. The future of the church is not depending on the young priests. I think you to keep in mind that that is narrowing our, um, our point of view. Because the priests are not, the church is not dependent on the future of the priests and, and, and other side. Concerning the young priests, uh, Yes, we know that situation, that since 20 or 30 years in some areas, we have in the seminaries uh, young men who are interested in the First Vatican Council Church. <laughs> Let me say that in a very polite manner. So that means there we have a real clash between two visions of church. And it's not possible to, as I, I hope, 
I hope that these young colleagues will gather some experience in life and faith. And will come also to, to, a, new, to a new decision making about their ministry. The pity is that in the moment, young men who are related to parish communities, who have in their vision uh, the, the service, the ministry for, for communities at the base of the church in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, they don't want to, uh, to enter the seminaries because there is some difference between their vision and the official uh, version which is delivered to them officially. And the other thing is, the other problem is, young men who, are, would, who would be interested in this ministry to being priest for parish communities are looking at us, our generation, more and more traveling around between, in Austria, three, four, six, up to 20 villages being only the one who is, who is arriving by car, is hurrying to the church, celebrating Mass, climbing back into the car, and if a Catholic is quick enough, he can, uh, he can have a short dialogue, beginning with the words, <laughs> Father, I know that you have, to, you have not much time. <laughs> That's not the picture which is uh, provoking you to decide for a ministry in priesthood. So therefore, there are a lot of, this, yes, the young men must, must make their, their, their decisions. We can only discuss with them, as we do in Austria. We can only exchange our experiences, our way to this, to this advocacy for the people of God. And we can only hope that the things are changing in that way, that young men and so we hope also young women who are interested in the ministry for the parishes at the base of the church are again interested in this ministry and are entering the education for it. I think maybe we will see a more principal change in ministry as we can imagine in the moment. A, a, a diversified change, a, a change in, in, re, in, in, the, in the direction of diversification, in the direction of being rebuilt in just another way. So it's not only the question if for that classical model of priesthood's ministry uh, we will have a future. Maybe the future will tell us that we have again, as had so often happened in the history of this church, that will again, again have, has to, uh, to be changed also this ministry in structure. And therefore maybe I am, I am one of the priests who, who are assisting this change and uh, experiencing it, it in, the, in their own development. So. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Father Helmut Schuler, co-founder co and leader of the Austrian Priest Initiative. Thank you very much, Father Schuler. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.